Okay. We're going live. Hopefully you guys are with us. Thanks so much for joining us. This is Mod City Live, Voltage Control Lab. Uh, is it Mod City Live if it's not Saturday? I don't know, but uh, we're going to call it Mod City Live Spring Break. Maybe that's the right way to go. Um, so here we are. It's Monday, March 23rd. Wow. So we're still doing this thing. Hopefully you guys can make it in here and uh, sit with us for a little bit of time. We're going to look at envelopes today and uh, talk about function generators, things that are going to smooth out the opening and closing process of a gate signal. And we're going to talk about what that is briefly. Terror, what's up? Thanks for joining us. Thanks for coming in here. Everybody else out there who might be with us or on their way in, we appreciate your, your joining us. Um, so, still um, figuring out what to do about the copyright claim. That video is still live. I think we're going to keep on doing those every Friday. The, the sound recreation, uh, the sound reverse engineering from tracks that you like, tracks that you recommend, things that, uh, that you want to make, that you want to know how to make. And uh, you can give me a challenge and uh, entertain yourself while I make a fool of myself on camera. So, um, what's up, Astrofish? VM Sky, thanks again for joining us. Christian, good to see you. Hope you're all maintaining and uh, being uh, productive and happy and keeping in good spirits. And uh, I know it's challenging sometimes, but we got to keep trucking. Keep on trucking. Keep a trucking on. All right, so here we are today. Uh, we're talking about envelopes. And I think before we even really look at the envelopes too much, though, there's a couple of envelopes. Um, we'll maybe look at some graphics that will give us a little bit of a visual reference to what it is we're dealing with, right? Envelopes are... Uh, one of the most important forms of modulation that we have. Um, I think I mentioned last week that there's, in my mind anyway, kind of uh, currently trucking. Glad to hear it, Jen. Uh, watch the, keep your eyes on the road, I guess, is my best advice to you. Um, so last week we were talking a little bit about um, plates and this, that, and the other. We were on Friday doing some of the sound recreation. And part of that process of sound recreation is trying to find some definition in certain aspects, certain elements of, a, uh, of any sound, right? There are going to be some commonalities from sound to sound. And uh, there are certain landmarks we can try to watch out for, right? Things that we can try along the way to use as uh, leverage points, things that we might be able to easily, or at least with a little bit of training, um, somewhat easily define for ourselves. And using descriptive language, even that's not necessarily musical language, can help us in that process. So we'll probably hit upon some of that language today in dealing with envelopes. But let's think about the, the elements that make up a sound, right? What are those elements? Now, maybe you guys can shout them out in the chat room if you know. There should be a few different kind of core descriptive qualities to any given sound. And uh, we might want to be able to define those qualities, right? 
Um, I'm reloading my chat because for whatever reason, the chat dies every once in a while. Maybe it would be easier if I used Chrome instead of Firefox for the streaming functionality, but um, we're going to get your chat back up here in two seconds. And maybe you've already thrown in a couple of ideas as to what those elements are. Um, let's see. And no. So let's talk about those elements. Um, one of them might be very obvious from one sound to another. Okay, hey, what's up, Selectro? I still see Skeletor every time I see your name. Um, ADSR, certainly uh, that's the envelope functionality that we're most likely, most commonly going to be coming into contact with. Um, but we use the ADSR envelope to control these other aspects, right? Cheshire, thanks for coming in here. Um, okay, now we're seeing some uh, some answers here. Selectro says waveform, amplitude. Okay, now we're getting some answers. Astrofish, I think you've got a couple of points there. The, the let's pick some of these out. Pitch. That's one of those elements that we can probably pretty quickly, even without too much of a musical background, we can probably find the range of, uh, uh, of extremes within which we're working, right? When we talk about pitch, we also are really meaning frequency, right? Um, it, it, we could even break that down into frequency range. Is this a high frequency sound? Is this a low frequency sound? Is this a middle, middle range frequency sound? Does it have a lot of frequency material present? When we start thinking about that, maybe we're starting to think about another aspect of um, defining a sound, right? So maybe pitch or frequency would be our first one. That's one that might be very obvious to our ears, okay? Another one, as Selectro mentions there, is amplitude, okay? Amplitude, we can commonly think of in terms of the actual sound character um, as maybe volume, right? The, the amplitude of something is the intensity of something, right? The intensity of a signal. Now, when that's coming from an oscillator, that might tend to feel like volume, but amplitude might describe many things, just like frequency might be uh, describing many elements of a sound, not just the, what we perceive as the pitch or the volume in the case of amplitude, but maybe other aspects of control of that sound. But pitch, volume, Right? How do these things change over time? Is there a pitch change over time? Is there a volume change over time? There almost always will be because most of the sounds that we uh, make, that we listen to, that we recreate, that we perform in a keyboard sort of based setting or even a sequencer based setting, they have a beginning and they have an end, right? Most sounds don't drone on forever unless it, they're specifically drone sounds and if they are it, it, you know sounds that we hear around us that are droning sounds that aren't necessarily musical um might tend to annoy the hell out of us and maybe anger us or make us perk up and say oh something's wrong right but most of the sounds that we naturally hear in the world have a beginning and an ending, even if they're happening very fast, like um, like a, a cricket uh, rubbing its legs together to make its sound. It might seem consistent and constant, but um, best vocoder song I think you mean ever, Paul Hardcastle, Sound Chaser. We might have to go find that. Um, Maybe we'll do that as one of our sound recreations on, on Friday. Um, <laughs> I got you there, Jeff. Thanks for joining us, by the way. Um, um, panning, that starts to get into the area of amplitude control, right? Maybe uh, volume of the left or the right signal, this type of a thing, right? So where are we 
if, if we digress a bit, where were we? We were with pitch. That's maybe our first definable element of a sound. Amplitude. That's a very definable element of a sound. Um, you know, is it short and fast? Is it long and evolving? Is it something that starts percussively in a percussive nature, instant volume change to from nothing to full volume and then gone? Or does it fade in over time? Does it fade out over time? Does it stay present for the length of the note loud and strong? Or is there an accent at the beginning of that note? Right? This is maybe some material that we could use to describe amplitude. What about waveform, right? Selectro and Astrofish and VM Sky, these things are all connected. Timbre, tone, wave shape or waveform, these things are all directly connected. And this is maybe our third element. Yes, I was watching uh, Inglorious Bastards last night, so I'm doing it this way, um, the German way. Pitch, amplitude, timbre, or tone, which also we might think of as the wave shape of our oscillator or the resulting change to that wave shape thanks to a filter or something like that or a, dis or a distortion. Um, timbre is maybe the hardest one for us to, at least from a, a less experienced perspective, to define, but let's think about the ranges of of uh, 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 motion with our other two examples. Pitch, for instance, right? We have very low frequencies, we have very high frequencies, and there's a whole range of frequencies in between those. 20 hertz, maybe the lowest frequency that we can hear. 20,000 hertz, maybe the highest frequency that we can hear. And in between that, we have this whole range of material and when we hear a sound, we can maybe, you know, we don't need to know the frequency specifically so much. We can use our ear and we can kind of say, is it, which end of the scale is it on? Is it low? Is it high? Is it somewhere in the middle? Even that might be enough to lead us in a certain direction, right? To start in the right octave, even. Um, volume, very easy to maybe think about the extremes there. We have silent, and then we have way at the top, super loud. I mean, 100% volume, what would we call that? We can probably consistently go louder and louder. To a certain point, of course, we start distorting a signal, maybe destroy our, our speakers. So, but I think we can maybe just agree on silence or really loud as kind of our extremes there, right? And there's a whole range of volume in between there. And when we hear something go from silent to very loud and then maybe, or maybe just partially up the way to loud, right? Quiet in the musical world, we call this piano. This is the dynamics uh, um, uh, terminology, right? When we hear the word dynamics or dynamic range, we really th should be thinking about the loudness or the volume intensity range. So um, in, in the musical world, now it might not directly connect to volume per se, but the intensity, the, the loudness in the musical world, when we write music on a manuscript paper, we have dynamics and those tell the instrumentalists how loud relatively to play. So we have these kind of scales that we can work with talking about pitch from low to high pitch, volume from silence to as loud as we can get, right? Somewhere in between there might be where the action is happening, but we have some range of motion, some extremes by which we can start to gauge where is the sound that I'm trying to make? Where is the sound that I'm hearing in this range of pitches or this range of volume shape? How does that shape change? Uh, those are pretty easy to think about the range. When we think about timbre or tone, maybe it becomes a little bit more challenging because we need to define those edges, right? And if we haven't spent a lot of time with, especially our basic wave shapes, 
This is where basic wave shapes, boring as they may sometimes seem, are so critically important to starting to understand how a synthesizer works and how we can predict what's going to happen with it, how we can start to find this scale from the simple tone to the complex tone. And we have that, in a sense, with our basic wave shapes. We have the simple on the sine wave side of things. On the opposite extreme, with our basic shapes, we might go with one of two options, both of which are going to sound totally different. Sawtooth wave or a square wave, right? What happens when we, when we filter a sawtooth or a square wave? If we use a low-pass filter on either of those waves and we bring that low-pass filter frequency down into the low-frequency range, we start to see that those waves soften, they round off, and they become something that sounds a lot more like a sine wave. So those might not be the, the full range of extremes, of course, right? Now, timbre and tone is one of these elements that is probably the, the hardest of these three things to, to define. But nonetheless, uh, we can start to use that range of distance from simple on the sine wave side, complicated, arguably comparatively more complex certainly than a sine wave, it would be the sawtooth wave, maybe less tonally rich, but still on that complicated side of things would be the square wave. We could keep on going all the way to noise, right? We could go from sawtooth wave all the way up to something like a noise generator where we've got just uh, saturated frequency content on uh, across the spectrum, right? Uh, so, and sometimes we use one to supplement the other. So without getting too deep into that, that realm of discussion or, uh, uh, over tone shaping yet, we could do another day on that. Got cats playing in the background over here. Um, we, uh, we can start to use that sine wave to, to, to sawtooth wave or square wave as a bit of our range of motion, right? Um, okay, so that's three musical elements, sound relative elements that we can start to try to define for ourselves. Even if it's something like, uh, re with regard to tone, if the descriptive terminology is noisy or bright or dull or simple, uh, these are pieces of information that might start to lead us towards one end of the scale or the other. So those are three of the columns that hold up the the roof to the pantheon of sound design, right? So, uh, 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 frequency, timbre, amplitude. But what's the fourth one? The fourth one is kind of what we're starting to get into today, and that's modulation. <laughs> modulation, right? Modulation is change over time especially to those first three items, right? Um, maybe most immediately on almost every synthesizer is going to be modulation of amplitude or volume. And uh, this, it, or loudness, depends on what instrument you look on, how they're going to name and, and uh, classify these things. But we use some tool to control, to modulate the volume over time. Right, that's what gives us some customized, specialized motion and modulation and change of the volume over time from silent to loud to silent again, right? Or loud enough, anyway. So, we're going to most often for this purpose use an envelope. We might use LFOs. We might use them together so that we can get tremolo effect, right? So that we can modulate, we can maybe turn on and off notes when we want notes to be played, and then also get an effect of 
volume modulation from an LFO in the form of what we would in the musical world call a, a tremolo. Um, if we did that same thing to pitch, we might call it vibrato. Uh, so most often we're going to come across a certain kind of envelope and Terror named it up above, right? Um, the ADSR envelope. And that's what we're going to look at probably primarily today because this is the envelope that is the most common, right? Popularized uh, certainly in the musical world by Bob Moog. Um, the ADSR envelope is maybe not the most complicated envelope that we can find, but it's probably one of the simplest to locate and the simp and, and it has a lot of flexibility. That's really the benefit of the ADSR envelope. It might not be flexible enough for every sound. And for that, we have complicated envelope devices and, and certain synthesizers that maybe offer us unique functionality in the world of envelopes. One such synthesizer would be absinthe from native instruments, which for 20 years now, at least, I think, um, has been one of the go-to instruments for film composition and scoring, especially in the, uh, um, the late aughts, right? To late two thousands. Um, it showed up on every, you know, CSI like film or TV film score. Right. That any time they were going into the, the lab to analyze some DNA or something like that, you would hear absinthe. And one of the benefits of absinthe is that we can have these kind of endless um, functions, these endless, uh, constantly evolving and changing envelopes. Uh, there's no limit on how many you can have. It's really where one of the areas anywhere where absinthe excels beyond many other plugins. Um, but most of our plugins, most of our instruments are going to have something like an ADSR envelope. There might be caveats to that. For instance, the serum envelopes are AHDSR envelopes. And let's talk about maybe in a moment how that differs from our com common envelopes. But let's first look at a basic ADSR envelope. What does an ADSR envelope do? What are the A, the D, the S, and the R for, right? And um, to do, start this off, let's look at my desktop. Hey, there's you guys. I'm just gonna reload this again because it looks like the chat is dead. Um, okay, so here is a graphic. And if you do even, uh, well, now my face is starting to block it. Um, okay, let's just, Scoot this over here. That's better. Okay. So this is just from Wikipedia. And you guys can at any point Google ADSR envelope. And if you click on the image search, you're going to come up with a whole world of these different images, of graphics that look very, very similar to this. Okay. Now, what do we see here? Well, obviously, if you notice at the top, we see these arrows, we see the A to the D, the S, the R. We probably see this commonly seen shape. Um, let's move this down here. There we go. Raum, thanks for joining us. Michael, again, thanks for hopping in here. Always very happy to see you in the chat. I'm trying to get this window separated. There we go, that's much better. Okay, so the ADSR envelope, what the heck is going on here? Well, if you notice, this is on a graph, right? On the X axis, I think, is time. You see this little T down here? This is measuring time. Uh, uh, and then the Y axis, correct me if I'm wrong about that. Uh, we see amplitude, volume, intensity of the signal. Ed, thanks for joining us. Um, so time and intensity or amplitude. Now, notice at the bottom, 
we see this key pressed and then key released. This is referring to a note being played, right? We play a note over here where it says key pressed. We release that note when we see here key released. So this is time over the course of one note being played on a keyboard or one note being sequenced in um, our, a clip or one gate message from a sequencer or a clock source in our modular synth, right? This is when the step starts. This is when the step ends or maybe halfway to the next step starting, okay? But we can think of this as a note on and a note off, the note beginning, the note ending, or the message that's coming from the keyboard, a, a note that's programmed, or a note or clock pulse in um, a sequence. Now, when we press a note, when we play a note, when a gate message is sent to our envelope, that's when our envelope starts to perform, okay? So we start with a basic ADSR envelope with the A, the attack stage, right? And when we play that note, our signal rises from nothing, right? We go from silence, if we have this mapped to a, a VCA, we'll talk about the routing in a moment. Let's think about this in terms of volume though, for the time being. We go from silent up to full volume. You can see here, amplitude maximum. So 100%, right? And we do this indicated by this arrow over a certain length of time, right? This is a very specifically set amount of time. It's not um, a percentage, it usually anyway, it's a specific amount of time. And if we look at um, envelopes in the software world, we'll see this actually tied to milliseconds or seconds, right? On a hardware synthesizer over here, um, we might not see time accurately demonstrated on the panel, right? It might be very difficult to uh, properly um, uh, uh, mark the panel uh, to precise amounts of time. So we're doing it a lot more by feel and by ear when we move into the modular world. But this is a very discrete amount of time, specific, uh, an amount of time that um, begins and ends um, uh, at the, you know, however many milliseconds or seconds long we've set that attack to. And by the time we get to the end of that amount of time, we have reached full volume, okay? We, we immediately move along. After however many milliseconds or seconds the attack time is, we rise in that volume. And then after, let's say, 500 milliseconds, let's just imagine uh, half a second is what we have the attack set to, we immediately move along to the decay stage, also measured in time. And this is a reduction in volume or amplitude or signal. Oh, you just got maths today. You are a lucky devil, my friend. You you have years of fun ahead of you. Uh, we're gonna look a little bit at maths because it can act as an envelope. Um, I would highly recommend if you have maths, which is um, this module over here on the right, that one. Um, highly recommend you download the um, the maths graphic manual. Is that what it's called? I haven't looked at it in a minute, but it's the um, the illustrated manual. That's what it is. Um, it's like twenty five pages, thirty pages long. Each one describes a function that maths can perform, how to set it up, and what the expected results will be super, super useful to understanding that module. And in that module, we really, by definition, by default at the beginning of its, in its most basic use, we only get an attack and a decay. We can think of the attack as a rise in intensity, in amplitude, right? The decay is a fall in intensity and amplitude. And that's basically what we see 
uh, on maths. We see there's a rise section and then there's a fall section. So we'll come back around to that though in a moment. Um, these are amounts of time, okay? Now, as soon as that decay time has run its course, we move along to the sustain stage. Now, there's gonna be some caveats to these things, but if the sustain is, let's, okay, you could. Um, if the sustain is anywhere between one and 99%, notice that sustain is not an arrow uh, uh, indicating time. Sustain is a level control. It's the outlier here. These A, the D, the, the R, these are all measures in time, attack, decay, and release. Sustain, though, is a measure of level or amplitude. So if this is anywhere between 1% and 99%, our attack time will have the, it'll help bring the signal up. It'll, the r signal will rise. The decay time, the signal will fall back down. And when we get to the sustain stage, after this amount of time plus this amount of time, we'll hold at a certain volume level, a certain amplitude, right? Now, if this isn't controlling volume, that might seem a little bit weird, but this is volume control and it's gonna hold the volume or whatever signal we're, contro we're controlling somewhere above the zero point. So we're going to, when talking about volume, have a held note. As long as the note is still being pressed, right? We haven't released the key yet. So we press a key, we rise, we fall, and then we hold at a certain level. And then once we release that key, we get our release time. Again, another measure of milliseconds or seconds and uh, a fall all the way back down to silence, to that zero point. Now, sustain can be a little bit funky, right? If it's anywhere between 1% and 99%, um, maybe not all the way up into the, the 90s, we might not notice as much of a difference then. But really, anywhere between 1% and 99%, the attack and the decay might feel a bit like an accent at the beginning of the note. It depends on how long the attack and decay time are. but if these are relatively short, then we might feel like there's an accent at the beginning of this note. And then the sustain makes us feel more like we're actually holding that, that note after the accent. If we increase that sustain all the way up to 100%, we essentially negate the decay, right? The decay has nowhere to fall down to anymore. The decay is just kind of sticking it out in sustain at the sustain level. And in a sense, that, that kind of rules out the decay. It doesn't happen in, in, um, in a sense. And so we end up with this attack, sustain, release envelope, an ASR envelope. Now, ASR can also mean something else in the modular world. Um, it can be a, an analog shift register. But I do see it. You might have to... Uh, highlight that link and uh, and paste it. Yeah, that's the Maths Illustrated manual. Great, useful thing. Yeah, Lupop has a great Maths video. I think, I, don't, I can't remember if DivKid's done a Maths video or not, but a um, bunch of Maths videos in my old library um, on the YouTube channel as well. But um, Lupop has a pretty thorough one. And, uh, you know, we could spend a week on Maths if you guys want, we could go through that illustrated manual and talk about some of those those elements. Um, so I think where we're getting to now is that the ADSR envelope can be a multifunctioning device and modulation source. It can be an ADSR. That's maybe it's common use, an attack, decay, sustain, release envelope. But when we bring that sustain all the way up to 100%, we're essentially turning it into an ASR, an attack sustain release envelope, okay? Um, when the sustain is brought all the way down to 0%, then we're essentially negating the sustain and the release. Now, 
release time uh, in this state in, in this uh, um, case might be ruled out. It depends on the envelope. It depends on the design of the envelope specifically. So you might find on some envelopes that with sustain at zero percent, we still get some influence in the release time. It depends on how long the notes are that we send into the patch, right? Um, but the sustain is really what def defines the action of this ADSR envelope. Somewhere in the middle, we get a proper ADSR envelope. At its most extreme peak, we get an attack sustain release envelope. At its extreme uh, uh, low setting, its zero setting, we'll generally end up with an attack decay envelope with no sustain and probably no release. It depends on the length of the gate or the note that we send into it at that point. And as well, the the design, how the original maker of that envelope designed that envelope. So you might find, again, that sometimes when sustain is at zero, we get an ADR envelope. If we play a long note, uh, we might notice that there's that there's a release. If we do a very short note, we might end up with just an AR envelope uh, or an ADR envelope. But generally, I think of this, and commonly this will be the case, as just an attack decay envelope. Something very useful for sequencers, where we might be stepping through notes fairly rapidly, right? If you think about, we, we had a discussion last week about the 303, and how it just has a decay knob, right? No sustain on a 303, no release on a 303, no attack even, because the attack is always going to be per percussive, punchy, thumpy like a bass. But it does have decay. And that decay is, uh, the, you know, we're limited to a decay because it's a sequenced instrument. It's meant to be um, uh, sequenced as a, uh, um, you know, maybe a fast moving synth. If we even think about how a bass works, there's no sustain on a bass or a guitar, unless you have some tool, some pedal or some, you know, electronics built into your instrument. There's, or you're using an Ebo or something like that, which will magnetically vibrate your string. There's no sustain on a bass. So you pluck the note and it's just, and that's, but, sorry, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. The 303 was a bass instrument, right? It's a it's an instrument that's designed to replicate poorly, perhaps, the sound of a bass. But that is uh, uh, not an instrument that has sustain, right? We don't use a bow on a bass generally, on an upright bass, sure. But not so much on a, um, not so much on a plucked jazz type of bass, which is, really what they were going for with the 303. Um, I think we mentioned this last week, that the 303 was meant to be a baseline accompaniment instrument originally. Roland was not thinking about Acid House because it did not exist. They designed that instrument to be... Um, a, 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 to, so the guitarists could program in walking bass lines to play and solo over, so they could practice over their, their chord changes. And... Um, people hated it. Guitar players hated it because they probably hated the sound and they probably felt um, put off by the idea that a machine could take the place of a band member, which this is the early 80s, mind you. And so, um, you know, we even still deal with that mindset today. Uh, but back in the 80s, it was still fresh and, and raw for musicians. And uh, so that instrument did not fulfill its original purpose. It was picked up out of the out of the um, the garbage pile and repurposed by people who needed cheap instruments, who didn't know anything about playing a bass necessarily, or didn't care about playing a bass. They wanted to make something that was different, and and uh, they wanted to use whatever tools they had accessible to them, which often was the TB-303 because everybody hated it. As, as That was another problem. Great point, G. Dizzle, and thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us, Brian and Mark. Um, yeah, the, it was not an easily programmable instrument. That was another problem. A guitar player might try to program an, 
TB303 and become very frustrated very quickly, as even those of us who, who are pretty adept at sequencing would. So um, it is part of the charm, but, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that sometimes it feels like the there's a, a for some people anyway, there's a disconnect not being able to get maybe the instant access that we expect out of the instrument that we already know and have trained on out of a box, which is claiming to make things easier for us. So, um, you know, that's just kind of the, the, one of the reasons why that instrument looks the way it does. It was meant to perhaps poorly recreate, but cheaply recreate the sound of a bass. And um, bases don't have sustain or release times, really. They just have attack and decay, the pluck and the, and the ringing out of that note. So, you know, we're really talking here about the fact that the ADSR envelope is um, a malleable tool. It's a modulation source that has many functions and uses, and we can get those nice, plucky, short, sequence-like patterns out of it and still shape them a little bit. Or we can play something nice and expressive on a keyboard where we might have long and short notes, right? This is one of the reasons Bob Moog chose the ADSR envelope, at least in my imagination. Uh, it could be performed. You could play a keyboard and have um, a, a melodic sequence that had short, long, uh, short and long notes, expressive performance that without sustain, we maybe lose a little bit out of, of that expression. It might still be a cool limitation for lots of neat things, but nonetheless. Um, so, um, absolutely. G Dizzle. It's uh, it's one of these things that uh, it's useful to know what the motivations were of the designer sometimes with these instruments. And um, I can't speak to Bob Moog's motivations personally because I sadly never got to meet the man. But um, uh, the net result of it anyway was that we can actually play the keyboard that's attached to the instrument in an expressive musical way that keyboardists might be able to um, instantly adapt to. That's one of those elements that made that instrument different and approachable, that early mini Moog especially. But, um, and one of those elements that maybe turns off other, other musicians, right? Um, it's true, Ed, notes can be long and short at the same time or in the same sequence, right? So, um, Okay, well, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense, right? We play a note or we, we trigger a note, and for each note, we're going through this process, right? This is happening sometimes on a very, very, very fast scale, right? So um, this is something that we have to ponder and, and, uh, uh, and practice with. So let's go over to the instrument. Let's come back over to the modular synth. And at the modular synth, hopefully you guys can see what's going on over here. Let me just not step on my headphone cable and move my mic around a little bit. And I'm going to bring your chat up here where I can actually see it. Sweet. Okay, so we can convert this all to software talk uh, if we like. But I think the modular is going to give us the kind of the same kind of action that we're going to expect usually from an envelope. Um, OK, so the first thing we need when we're using an envelope, maybe the only thing we need outside of the envelope, is a gate signal. OK, and here's our gate signal. Now, let's visualize this gate signal. I'm going to put it into input two on the data because, in fact, this isn't really a gate signal. Um, now, that's probably the wrong color. Let's put it in this one. Okay, so now 
maybe we can see that there is a green line that's appearing on the screen. That green line is simply a square wave, okay? Now we could use a unipolar gate signal. That's what a clock will send, right? If we send a, a clock signal, let's say from the Wogglebug or Tempe or something like that, looks very similar, except the signal starts at this middle zero point, goes up and comes back down to that, that zero middle point. That's commonly what we're going to see in the form of a gate, okay? It's an on and off signal, brutal, right? And in fact, if we take that signal and we patch it to our oscillator, or not to our oscillator, sorry, to our VCA, over here, I have an oscillator going into a VCA, and we're going to use this gate signal to open and close that VCA, okay? Let's see if we can hear that. So now we've got a signal. Hopefully you guys can hear this. Maybe it's too loud, let me know if it is. Should be, should be okay. Um, We've got a signal coming in. That signal is turning our VCA on and off. It's opening and then closing that VCA. Very brutal. In fact, maybe I can... A little bit closer to a sine wave there, maybe triangle wave or something. But you can hear at the beginning and end of those notes, kind of a click. Maybe you guys can hear that. Maybe you can't. The uh, My audio interface clicks all the time in my ear. So maybe you're hearing that click. Maybe you're, I'm just hearing lots of clicks. But this is such a brutal on and off effect. It doesn't give us a lot of motion or control over the shaping of the volume. And that's really the problem with a gate. It's great if we just want those brutal, whoops, those brutal on and off effects. But not so great if we want some shape and character to our, our envelope. Now, we can maintain that shape if we do like that shape. Okay, great. Um, we, we, if we do like that shape, we can always recreate it inside of an envelope, right? In fact, we can take that gate again and we'll send it into the gate input on our envelope. And we'll send that signal out now to fast mode here. We send that gate out to our oscilloscope and then out from that to control our oscillator. So now we can probably still hear that click, right? We've patched that same gate into the gate input on our envelope. This is something that um, if you're working inside of a plugin, uh, we can kind of expect this to already be patched, already be mapped out. And, you know, when we play a note or a sequence a note inside of a, uh, our DAW, it's, it's already going to trigger our envelope. In the modular world, we have to route that gate to the envelope. So we've done that. And notice how our envelope is set up right now. We're working with this top ADSR envelope. This is the IntelliGel dual ADSR, by the way. This is not a sponsored video. Um, we have the attack stage set to zero. We have the decay set to zero. We have the release set to zero. So, and sustain is all the way up at 100%. So when we trigger this thing, when we send a gate in, we get an instantaneous rise, very similar to the gate. We get 100%, there's no decay because it's set to nothing and sustain is all the way up at the top, right? We sustain full volume, full signal. As long as that gate stays high, the sustain is staying high. And then as soon as that gate drops back down, 
release is also at zero. So we instantaneously whoosh, chop it off again. So we can think of this as a gate in terms of the actual shape. And with the sustain all the way up here at, at uh, 100%, we end up with essentially an attack sustain release envelope. So when we start to increase the attack and the release time, we're going to soften the onset and the end of this gate signal. And by, by uh, uh, definition along with it, the sound. We are in fast mode, so these are short attack and decay times relatively. And look at the shape on the oscilloscope, right? Instead of that full incoming signal instantaneously turning up, instantaneously turning back down, when the note ends, when the gate ends, we have a nice softening of that rise and that fall. We still have the sustain, but we have no click anymore. And even with just a teeny bit of, I need a little bit more on the attack side. There we go. We might still want it to be percussive, so we don't have to turn it all the way up. But we can turn it up just enough and that click kind of goes away. Okay, now let's start turning the sustain down. And we'll turn the decay up. You can see when the sustain isn't high, the attack and decay tend to seem like a little bit of an, uh, of a, an accent. Sustain comes up, starts to feel like less of an accent. until we get to the top with that and we just get an ASR envelope again. If we bring the sustain all the way down, we get an attack decay envelope. And this allows us to speed up that, that clock, that gate. Look at that. When we speed it up fast enough, where the decay is longer than the gate, you get a weird click off. Might indicate that this is an attack decay release envelope. If we turn that up a little bit. Notice if I turn up that decay, can even see it here. The gate ends and the decay chops off. That's indicating that it's looking for the release. So on the dual ADSR, we actually have an ADR envelope when we dial that sustain down.
Okay. So hopefully we see now there's perhaps multiple um, uh, envelope shapes contained in the ADSR envelope. Um, now, if we go back to another early electronic music instrument, the, the bukla, this had a built-in um, a, a built-in sequencer, right? A five-step sequencer, but a built-in sequencer nonetheless. And also a built-in uh, touch plate controller. We still see that on the, the modern Buchla, even though they've uh, maybe changed it to look less like the classic uh, Thunder shape, more like the, the, the keyboard that we, we recognize uh, from traditional um, semitonal piano keyboards. But built into that instrument is an ASR envelope. If we don't send sustained gates to it, it effectively becomes, or if we just trigger that envelope, it effectively becomes an attack decay envelope. And that's very close to what we see inside of maths over here. If we look here, we see one channel of maths. We can turn it off cycling mode. Uh, which, of course, turns this channel into a looping envelope or an LFO, right? Even the dual ADSR has that. We can just turn this thing on, and we get the looping envelope. So we can use these as kind of sort of LFOs, but maths can take uh, um, a, a gate signal or a trigger signal in two different places. It has a separate trigger input as well as a signal input because maths, uh, thanks to its um, open-ended complex nature, can actually take a signal and do all kinds of things with it. But in its most basic form, we have a rise control. We can think of this as an attack. And a fall control. We can think of this as a decay, or we'll see, we can also think of it as a release. And we also have a, a time, um, this is the very response knob, I think they call it, a variable time control, which affects the length of, and the shape also of the rise and the fall time. So maybe let's, Instead of patching out of that, let's take another cable here, patch out from the maths channel. Now, I'm going to patch out of the unity output at the bottom here. We could also patch from one of these one, two, three, or four outputs, on, especially in this case, channel the, the channel one output, because that's the channel we're using. But we'll use the unity output. This will give us our full range signals coming from maths. So we're going to take that gate, that same gate that we were using, and we're just going to send it into the trigger input. Speed it up a little bit there. And we can, I think, zoom in. OK, so I think this sends actually 10 volts. So maybe we could also, yeah. 0 to 10 volt envelope shape. Um, pretty intense. Um, yes, if we turn up, Jeff, great point there. Mitch, by the way, hello. Jeff mentions if we um, turn up the frequency, if we shorten, if we turn on cycle on and then very... Uh, uh, turn the fall and rise times to a very short setting. We can get a an oscillating um, signal. We can also do frequency modulation in a loose sense as we go from one oscillator's output to control the both. Uh, we see here the both um, um, input. This will change the time of both of the attack and rise. Or sorry, the the rise and fall times at the same time. No, we do not have anything playing yet. Um, 
just kind of looking at what this signal is going to look at. Now, and there we get our, our shapes. Okay, so we're sending a trigger in right now. This is going to give us an attack decay envelope. Okay, this attack decay envelope does not have a release time. It does not care how long the gate is. It only cares about the incoming trigger because we've put it into the trigger input, okay? The trigger input only, and triggers in general, are very similar to gates, except the trigger doesn't care how long you hold it, the, the note. It just cares that you said, play a note. So the note off, the end of the gate, doesn't matter to a trigger input. If we were using a trigger signal, it would probably look much shorter in length than a gate, but otherwise it would probably look the exact same. It might only last 10 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds, but um, other than that, it looks and feels very similar to a gate, except that any input that expects a trigger does not care when that trigger or gate ends. All it cares about is that rising gate on note on signal. So this is responding to that. And it doesn't care if you're playing a long note or a short note. It just knows what the fall time is set to. If we use this variable response knob at the bottom, you'll see that the rise and fall shape will change as well as getting longer or shorter. If we go to the left towards the logarithmic side, we get these more rounded humps in the rise and fall. And the further we go down with that knob, the longer the envelopes get. If we go the other way, the rise and fall time bend inward instead of outward. We get much shorter, pluckier notes. Down to just little tiny chops. And notice there's a little line there. I don't know if you can see that on that knob. There's a little line that's linear mode. And if you notice that should, in theory, it's not notched or anything, but in theory, it should yield flat shapes on that rise and fall time, as opposed to the kind of curved inward or outward shapes from logarithmic or exponential. Um, that's going into the trigger input. If we send this instead into the signal input right next to the trigger input with the little arrow going into it, then things change a little bit. Let me see if I can make this thing actually not be in the way. There we go. And now the signal on the oscilloscope should look a little bit different. Let me see if I can block the light there. There you go. There's the gate input as opposed to the trigger input, right? In the signal input, we get a plateau. That's the sustain, right? We're rising over a certain amount of time, and then we're sustaining until the end of the gate, until the gate turns off at that signal input. And when it does, we fall back down. So we rise, we sustain, and then we fall. Attack, sustain, release. Okay, so on a modular synth, it depends which input or which signal we use, okay? We might be able to use either one of those signals. And of course, things get interesting if we start taking 
that same this is coming this is a clock coming from the woggle bug right now the woggle bug also produces a stepped random voltage at that same frequency the same pace the same clock tempo so if we let's say route that out to control the fault time maybe it'll speed it up a little bit Yeah, exactly. This is very similar to function, which is basically just like one side of maths. Some benefits to function. It does slightly different things to maths. Uh, but maths is fun because we can get these two sides going and, and interfacing with each other. We can even build an ADSR envelope out of maths by employing both channels together. It's kind of a waste of maths in my opinion. It's a genius exercise, however, in learning maths, because you start to see how one interface or one channel can interact with another and the levels, uh, uh, the, the mixer controls in the center here. And of course, we could take this, this woggle bug signal, maybe take the Instead of just patching this to fall time to modulate the decay, we could patch it to the bolt input. Keep in mind when it's playing those low notes, it's it's sending a low or the, the really short notes, it's sending a low voltage. So that's why we're not really hearing many low notes coming through the oscillator. At least when I'm modulating pitch. Okay, so that's fun and fine and dandy, but Let's slow that down a bit. And what happens when we start using this envelope to modulate some of those other two elements, right? What about pitch? What about tone, right? These are also critically important to modulate with an envelope to at least try out, to at least experiment and get the, you know, get the hang of using these things, right? So, um, yeah, that all those variations were really coming from modulating the fall time, right? So this would be decay on any other envelope. This is something to maybe watch out for when we are shopping for envelopes, if we're looking for modular anyway. Um, uh, does the envelope that I'm interested in offer the ability to modulate those parameters, the attack time, the decay time, and the release time especially? Um, uh, something like the quad LFO, or sorry, the quad envelope from Maleco as a built-in sequencer. So you can modulate and sequence the different parameter settings per step. Um, the, you know, you can see on the dual ADSR, we don't have the ability really to modulate anything other than the level, um, which I suppose 
is the level of the whole en envelope, not just the level of the sustain stage. Um, and then out of the, the outputs, we have our kind of our, our basic zero into the positive range envelope. That's what we'll use generally for volume change. We have zero into the negative range. We could almost get some side chain like effects if we turn the volume up on a channel and then use this to turn it down and back up. Um, and and a gate signal that will come out whenever we reach the end of a decay stage. Um, right, EOD, yep, end of decay. Um, notice maths also has a gate output down here that says, hard to read, but it says EOR, end of rise time. So at the end of the rise, it actually sends a gate. We can use that when we start patching maths inside of itself. Um, gets to be a, a very useful thing to have those elements. We can make one envelope trigger when another envelope reaches a certain, a certain stage. Interesting way of, of patching. But um, let's keep it simple. Let's try routing the envelope, maybe a second envelope, to um, uh, another one of those parameters that we were talking about earlier. We're going to take... I'm going to take that clock and I'm going to send it to a couple of places, right? Not just the current envelope, but another envelope as well. Um, let's take this thing. We'll trigger our volume envelope again. Whoops. Now, one thing I'll, I'll point out right now, we could, of course, take the output of this envelope and uh, uh, use a stackable, use a, a mult to uh, route this envelope to multiple places, right? If we're in the, uh, the software realm, we could route our volume envelope to, right, our envelope one on Serum, envelope four on massive, which is our envelope, uh, our, our volume envelope in massive, um, or the amp envelope in wavetable or whatever, right? The, the, usually these envelopes are routable to other places. We can assign that same envelope that's by default controlling volume to control something else. But I would recommend that you try to avoid that because when we do this, it starts to limit the ability to shape the sound in a unique way from volume to tone or pitch. We might want those things to be very different. We're gonna see why in just a minute when I route this other envelope to control the pitch on our oscillator right now. Um, for instance, let's take that same clock, that same gate signal, and we're gonna trigger, um, I'll just trigger the other channel on maths for now. And I'm going to route that channel, I hope this will reach, all the way over here to the FM input on our oscillator. And when I do that, um, I would say it does make a bit of a difference, VM, because the... Um, the accuracy of the timing of the envelope might be easier to uh, to tell on a digital envelope. For instance, if we were to look at the digital envelopes on the ornament and crime, those are going to be a lot more controllable, uh, definable in terms of their settings than say um, maybe a knob on on a panel. That might not tell us exactly how long that envelope is, but a digital envelope just might. Um, uh, you know, there's other problems potentially with digital modulation sources, like right? we might get unwanted stepping depending on the resolution of the, uh, the digital audio converter that's built, uh, you know, the DAC that's convert, uh, that's built into any digital module. Um, so in, in a sense, there are some, some complexities, some differences there, but, um, you know, Nonetheless, uh, both have, I think, their, their 
place. And I don't think it, you know, it's not that big of a difference if we're just looking for envelopes. I would look more for one that has features that you like and operates in a way that makes that makes some sense. Um, okay, so we've got now one envelope routed to volume. One envelope is routed to the FM input on my oscillator. And I'll just set the second channel on maths to be very similar to the first channel. And that way we'll probably hear some similar shape there. So I'm gonna turn up the FM input or the FM uh, attenuator, I should say. Now, we're hearing some pitch change, but we might want the volume to stay, you know, its, it's length, but the pitch change to happen much faster. Right? What if we turn down the the fall time, the decay time, on our pitch envelope? Maybe turn down our. Pitch a little bit too. No pitch envelope. Pitch envelope. We also might want our volume envelope to be more of a attack sustain release envelope. While our pitch envelope is still an attack decay envelope. And turning up the FM attenuator on my oscillator, you can make it go higher in pitch. We might not want it to be that long. So we go from a nice low dull tone with no pitch envelope to something that sounds a little more like a kick drum. Fast attack, long release, longer release, not very long release, but Take this down into some 808 range. Well, G Dizzle asks a great question. When would you use the envelope generator into an oscillator FM input versus something else? That something else would maybe be the volts per octave input, right? The, the benefit of using the FM input is that the volts per octave input is free. We can use that to control the pitch, right? If we wanted to play a bass line with this 808-ish sound that we're making, we could still tune the instrument using a sequencer, right? Um, the FM is free for us to do the pitch modulation, and it also gives us that FM attenuator 
or a tenu verger, as the case may be. Uh, Astrofish, by the way, we're using um, plates or my knockoff version of plates for now. Um, the uh, and we're in FM mode, so we're just hearing a sine wave basically right now. And um, the os the volt volts per octave input, the pitch control is still free. So I can do some pitch modulation. I could actually play a bass line, right? But we're getting that intensity, that oomph from the pitch modulation coming from the envelope into the FM input. And that also lets us attenuate how much of that envelope control, how high in pitch we want that, that punch to go. Right now, it's just turned up to go maybe like an octave. We could keep turning that FM attenuator up. Might keep it really short. And when we do keep it really short and we just turn it up a little bit, Sounds just a little bit like a, like a punch. Turn it up a lot more. Starts to sound a little more laser-like. We could extend the decay time a little. We could turn up the pitch of the whole oscillator. Maybe shorten our volume envelope. So we get lasers. That kind of thing. Good. Increase the attack time on our pitch envelope. Shorten our volume decay. Get kind of like this bubbly sound. And this is a this is one of these exercises that I would recommend everybody do on whatever synthesizer you use. Hardware, software, whatever. Sine wave, volume envelope, pitch envelope. That's it. There's a world of sound just in those things. And uh, even just the attack decay stages of the envelope, we get a whole realm of sound creation possibilities, okay? Um, you know, of course, then the other option, I think, would be tone shaping, right? That's our, our timbre side of things, which maybe if we patch that envelope somewhere else, instead of the FM input, let's turn up our volume envelope a little bit, turn up the pitch a bit. Maybe we'll try going into one of the, we'll go into the timbre input on plates. I'll turn up the attenuator on that. And so now it, it's as if I'm just turning up and down this knob, right? But... Now the envelope's gonna do it for me. This is FM mode, so envelopes are super critical to making FM sounds um, palatable and sound expressive and interesting. Otherwise, you just end up with these things like that. Just... Not so pleasant. Maybe you like it, maybe it's pleasant for you. Input. 
Jesuits. We could, of course, send this through a filter, right? Instead of just uh, going right out to the amp here, let's try sending the oscillator into a low-pass filter. And unmute. Now let's turn down the resonance. Let's try low pass four. So no filtering. Let's try. One thing I don't know how to get out of this thing is a sawtooth wave. <laughs> So there we go. There's a tone as we turn up the filter. The tonal shape changes. And we do not have anything plugged into the rise and fall uh, inputs. But we do have that channel four on maths controlling now the frequency on our cutoff envelope. Or sorry, on the cutoff on our filter. Sometimes our filters will have an attenuator or an FM input, which we can also use to control the amount of modulation. I'm using ripples right now. This is a mutable instruments heavy patch. Going from plates into ripples, our low pass filter, into veils, our VCA. I love ripples. I use ripples as my that's like my go-to kick drum module, actually. Um, we can hear that there's a there's a shape change there, right? The tone is being changed as the envelope rises and falls. So this is something that I would recommend that everybody try. Simple volume envelope control, and then take your second envelope or third envelope, route it to control the pitch, route it to control some sort of tonal shaping element inside of your patch, right? Something to give your, 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 your sound a little bit more expressive quality, color, feeling, that type of thing. Hopefully that makes sense. And maybe this will raise other questions that we can address in another episode. If it does, by all means, shoot your ideas at me and we will dig into those things. Um, just looking back here in the chat. The Envelator is a great envelope generator. It does have um, the delay stage, right? Sometimes we see, instead of ADSR, we see DADSR. And that first D does not also stand for decay, because there's nothing to decay, right? Um, that's delaying the attack stage. So it's adding a, a gap in between when the gate signal turns on and the gate and the actual envelope starts to rise, right? Um, 
FX Music, thanks for coming in here. You know, I've been talking about doing an FM episode, so maybe we'll be doing an FM episode this week, talking about the the basics of frequency modulation. Probably makes most sense to do that inside of software, I'm afraid, because FM in a mostly analog modular synthesizer gets a little bit hard to um, make controllable sounds. It's still a very useful technique in, in the modular world, of course, especially if we're less concerned about um, the subtleties of digital FM, and we just want to make sounds that are a little bit more aggressive and um, interesting and complicated and shredding, then it's great in an analog set, uh, uh, setting. But, you know, FM didn't really come into its its big time until the DX7, which is a digital synth. And uh, so it might be easier to conceptualize on a on a plug-in. So we'll figure that one out though. Maybe we'll do that later this week or next week or something like that. Um, ah, yeah. Some Roland modules have that delay, right? Um, and that delay just puts a short gap, right? On an LFO, the delay might do a fade in at the beginning of the LFO, kind of starting from no modulation and then kind of like increasing intensity over time. Um, essentially sending the LFO through a VCA and controlling the, uh, the attack time on that VCA, um, giving, us a, giving us a long attack so that the signal starts going um, slowly, starts going uh, um, a, a slimmer amplitude than um, it eventually arrives to. The, but yeah, the delay on an envelope will generally offset the beginning of the attack um, and, uh, you know, give us a literal delay before the, the envelope starts. That might be very slim because it's also measured in time. It might be measured in, you know, a couple of milliseconds delay. And um, so that might or might not be um, uh, preferable. And... Yes, you can do that with maths. It, uh, that starts to uh, demand that we start employing the um, both channels in one patch. There's also a HDSR, as Analog Assailant mentions. The H is hold, okay? And the hold happens between the A and the D, right? So uh, if we go back to our um, our graphic here, there would be a stage in between the A and the D, right? We're up at the top, we hold at the top, right? So it's also measured in time, just like the delay in a DAH, DSR, um, or uh, the decay and the attack and the release in our rest of our envelopes. Um, hold simply holds us at the top between an attack and a decay for a certain amount of time. So um feels kind of like a sustain sometimes but it doesn't work the same way as a sustain in terms of being a level measurement hold is simply uh, um, an amount of time holding the level high before we start to decay right so yeah remember our discussion about vcas last week right this this starts to get into the 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 uh the the VCA doing all these different things, right? Um, they, uh, including not just controlling the amplitude of our signal, but controlling the amplitude of an LFO, perhaps. Controlling the amplitude of an envelope, even. So we can use a VCA for many things in that respect. And um, um, essentially just controlling the intensity of any of these modulation sources in that, in that case. I see I've broken some brains. Uh, obviously, that is my, that's like, I've done something right. That's the sign. I'm here to break brains. Um, yeah. Well, I think that's long enough for today. What do you guys say? Um, yeah, well, Friday, we're going to do the whole 
um, sound recreation thing again. We have a few ideas already submitted. If you got other sounds you want us to recreate, um, shoot them my way. Um, I guess while we're here, I'll just ask, um, share, please, if you can, um, our video and the fact that we're doing live streams daily. Um, you can subscribe and and uh, do all those types of things on the channel if you aren't already. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and all of those types of things. And if you want to follow me and hear some of the music I've been making, I'm at Computo, C-O-M-P-U-T-O, and uh, on, on everything, SoundCloud, all the rest. And um, yeah. I'm sitting way at the front of my seat right now because there's a cat back here. See? Um, anywho... I think that's the show for today. And thank you guys for coming. Thanks so much for uh, uh, all you new folks coming in here. Thanks. And um, yeah, we'll be right back here tomorrow at noon Pacific Standard Time. Same time as today. Cat hair in my coffee as well. And um, yeah, I hope everybody has a great day. See you tomorrow. <laughs>